Today's meeting is not meant to be really like a formal seminar. So uh, the scope of the meeting is to kind of try to give an overview of what the migration track is about uh, by providing a specific example of a real project uh, I have to deal with. And the second thing is maybe you're not really aware of what development banks do. I'm sure you all heard of the World Bank. Uh, who, who hasn't? But maybe none of you has actually a very specific idea of how they operate. I don't know if you ever got a chance to read the project document or something like that. So uh, I really encourage you to start looking into those things before you graduate. So I would like to, on the one hand, to make you more familiar about this potential employer of yours, and on the other hand, uh, to show you why the migration uh, issue is very, very relevant. So maybe it helps in, in picking uh, your specialization. So, okay, I need to start with a disclaimer. So all the stuff I'm going to say is my personal opinion and does not represent anyone else. All right, so this is, the Inter-American Development Bank is a regional development bank. It's not part of the World Bank. It competes with the World Bank, okay? I'm sure you heard of regional development banks like the African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank, there's many, many more. The uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, what are they? Basically, these multilateral banks are sort of uh, credit unions of states. So you need, to be, you need to own some shares in order to access the resources from that bank. The Inter-American Development Bank is, is quite big for the region is actually the main source of funding for Latin America. So it allocates much more money than the World Bank in Latin America. So approximately 14 billion uh, this year. It has 48 uh, member countries and 26 are borrowers. So the Latin America and Caribbean region can actually request loans and grants from the bank. But then there are shareholders, like European countries mainly, who are also part of the bank, but they cannot request loans. If, if, it's, if it's not clear, just let me know. Now in green, those are the, those are the borrowing countries. And in red is the non-borrowing country. So you see also some interest in geopolitics, like China is now a shareholder of the bank. So if you, are from a, if you are from any of these countries, whether red or green, you can actually work for this bank. Okay, you, need, you need to be from a member country in order to work there. What, what uh, does a bank do? They give out loans. And this one also give, gives out grants, which a, a normal bank doesn't do. You can't, you can't really open an account there as a citizen. You access this bank if you're a country. Uh, loans can be sovereign and non-sovereign. So that's when loans are given to a state. But there is also areas of the bank that uh, lend money to the private sector. So in the, the rationale is, in those markets where the private uh, financial market is not developed enough, you can access, as a private company, you can access resources from these banks. Because sometimes it's too risky, the market is not really working, so a bank like this can give you, can give you resources. And then a big issue, um, a big um, part of the bank operation, not in absolute terms, but because of the importance it has in the region, is grants. So a lot of donor countries, Germany, Holland, uh, Spain, Italy, Canada, whatever, they create trust funds. So it's basically pots of money that sit into the Inter-American Development Bank. The Inter-American Development Bank manages those resources, and that's basically development aids. That's funding that is given for pilot projects, for research. And that's a very useful uh, resource because a lot of time you want to kickstart a project or you want to do something and it's pointless to give a loan of a few million dollars. So these resources are really important to generate some studies, to build capacity, to do some consultancies to figure out what's going on. I have, I have been doing a lot of work with uh, trust funds and with grants. It, it's, 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 it's funny because you're basically spending taxpayers, someone taxpayers' money into the region. Well, loans uh, requires a negotiation with the government. You need to come up with a, with a plan. Now, 
having said this, I wanted to uh, explain how a bank is working on the issue of migration, right? So, as I said, this is not a bank per se. My background is not in finance. My background is in political science and then public policy. But as development banks, they mobilize resources and they also provide basically advisory, consulting services for the countries, for our owners, for our member countries. And these are, these are some questions probably uh, you encounter, especially the first two ones. It's in the news every single day, so uh, I think it's important that you kind of try to think about it. Now, today's discussion I want to touch uh, specifically on the, on the initial four points. So there is a little bit of myths and confusion about migration. I want to share uh, about the region I, I know uh, most about, which is like Central America, specifically the so-called Northern Triangle, which is Honduras, Salvador, and Guatemala, it is one of the poorest areas of Latin America, one of the most dangerous areas of Latin America. So the homicide rate in El Salvador, for instance, is higher than Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, remittances, so the money that migrants send back, and then uh, brainstorm a little bit about the so-called diaspora. Diaspora is, is a word that it's uh, very famous now, and there isn't really a clear definition, but it basically refers to the communities abroad. So we're probably part of our diasporas if we're outside of our country. And we, can, we, can, we can skip the last one, but if, if there is time, I'll show you. So a couple, of, a couple of myths. Migration is at the highest levels in history. This is not true. There has been a uh, moment in history, especially uh, before the First World War, for instance, where there were more migrants than there are now. And I don't know if you heard of it, but it's, it's a very, uh, you, if you're into the migration track, then you will encounter a lot. But the percentage of people who migrate at global level is approximately 3.1%. So only 3.1% of the global population actually move. Internal migration is estimated to be three times as much. Of course, there are more regions of the world which are more, more, more mobile than others. But overall, the question should be, why so few people migrate, right? In a context where there are diseases and poverty and conflicts, only 3% of the people leave. Development in the country of origin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does this migration mean only refugees or generally migration? General migration. Okay. So people who leave their home country and they get out of a national border, mm -hmm. okay? Now, another, another issue, that, another uh, myth that you, you, you hear a lot is people leave because they're poor, so we should boost development back there so people will stop invading us, right? A lot of, lot of discussion like this. Now, if you think about it, the better, the, the better off you are, the more foreign languages you speak, the better skills you have, the more mobile you become because you can access employment abroad, you can learn a second language, so this second myth is just wrong. It's, it's much more complex than that. Poor people mainly migrate. This is another very wrong assumption. Uh, if you're starving, you don't, if you're starving, your priority is to find food for the day. You don't have enough resources to pay a smuggler uh, or to figure out how to go abroad. So most of the time, people who migrate are poor, but they're not the poorest of the poor. You need to have some resources, you need to have some social network, you need to have some family ties, right? This is, a, well, this is an example of the global migration flow. So if you, well, it goes until 2005, but if you think about it, if you look at the last 20 years, 15 years, you don't see any sharp or crazy peak all of a sudden. It has been sustained, it has been sustained for a while. Now, of course, migration is increasing, but also the, pop the global population is increasing. So in, in, in relative terms, uh, it hasn't changed much. And as you can see, we're kind of steady around 3% around of, the, of the world population. So where are people going? We tend to believe that like Africans uh, leave their continent to come north, so the so-called south-north migration. But there's actually much more going on. So there's a lot of south-south migration, which is approximately 
36%. So there is a lot of migration within Africa or within Latin America. There is south-north migration, which is the one that is in the news and which is the one that for some reason concerns us. There is also north-north migration. So if you look at mobility in the, within Europe or Canada in the US, and there is also north-south migration. Okay? This is also happening. There's also uh, Europeans retiring and moving to the Caribbean or, or moving to Latin America or to other countries. Now, this graph is very interesting because we tend to believe we tend to believe that with development, migration is going to stop. Now, so the more developed the more developed you are, the more immigration you you experience, right? Because the labor market is is growing. You need you need workers. But if you look at the immigration rate, it doesn't really go to zero. See what I'm saying? So it, it doesn't really stop. There isn't a point where uh, the Netherlands or Italy are so developed that there is no more immigration. Okay, what, uh, bear in mind that it is, is more complex than that. You start experiencing uh, kind of net immigration, so you're attracting more people than those who are living, but your people remain mobile. Okay, if you look at the statistics of Europe, uh, people are still going. I mean, when, when Spain, which is when Spain or Portugal were facing the recession, there, were, there was no starvation, there was no uh, lack of healthcare protection, but people were still, people were still moving, right? So again, there wasn't, there wasn't like a very urgent need to leave the country, but uh, we're becoming more mobile. So there is a, there is a correlation between development and, and mobility. Now, this is almost the same graph that you saw before, but with different, with bars. So as human development increases, so as development increases, you face more immigrants, right? And uh, immigrants tend to decrease over time. For some reason, these two subgroups of people with high and very high levels of human development don't make it to the news. If you think about it, we care only about people with very low or middle skills because those are the ones we consider problematic. Okay, so if we have a cardiovascular surgeon from Syria, it's not a problem because this guy is gonna work in a top-notch hospital in Europe and he's gonna probably save your life. But if we have a refugee with this level of human development coming into Europe, that same guy is problematic. Okay, so the, the subgroups with high level of, of, of human development don't make it to the news, but it's, but it's still happening, right? Well, some of the challenges of migration, I'm sure you, you have seen some of these. Fear of, of these people who are coming, we don't know who they are. They're gonna steal our job. Of course, they're all criminals. Uh, sometimes we need to be a little bit more careful in trying to look into that. So, are we talking about what types of migration are we talking about? Are we talking about documented migrants? Are we talking about undocumented migrants? Are we talking about asylum seekers? Are we talking about economic migrants? So, some migrants are just looking for a job because there is no opportunities back home. Some others are asylum seeker, and by law, we need to grant that protection. It's not. It's not because we're, uh, we woke up in a good mood. It's because our legislation, uh, we have an obligation to grant asylum to, the, to, to them. Some issues concern integration, languages, welfare services, the role of schools, protecting these migrants, the different types of migrants. What happened with the repatriation of these people? How are we handling them? So do we just drop them at the border? Do we fly them back? What happens when they're back? And then the issue of loss of human capital from the country of origin. So many countries train these people, they graduate, and then they can't find a job, so they leave, right? It's, it's an expense for the country, because they, uh, taxpayers spend money on, on them, and then they leave. But there's also a lot of opportunities, so um, there's, there's, there's a, um, an opportunity for economic growth of the country of destination. So if you look at some uh, statistics when 
Florida was invaded by the Cubans uh, or, or, or other episodes in history, there is no evidence that actually the economy was worse off. Because it's true that the host country might face higher costs in terms of welfare, but then you also need to generate more uh, goods and services like more housing, more infrastructure, so you're automatically investing and, and, and they boost the economy. Remittances is another, is another uh, big opportunity. We're not making babies in Europe anymore, so we need new workers who are actually paying for the pensions of those who are retired. Labor market shortages. It's true that we have a high youth unemployment in Europe, but none of us is willing to collect uh, watermelons with 40 degrees in the countryside. We rather stay home and do something else. So that's a segment of the economy which need workers. Cultural innovation, poverty reduction. Well, some countries, you see, tertiary educated people, so especially small and insular countries have a very high level of immigration, right? So if you're a doctor in Guyana, of probably 90% of them leave because there's no opportunity there. So just very quickly, I'll go through this. So I said that 3% of the world population migrates. Uh, Central America is an exception. It's very mobile, so more than 9%, approximately 10% of the region leaves. Uh, and it's not a new phenomenon. It has been going on for a while. 20% of those born in El Salvador are abroad. 6% of Honduras and Guatemala. 90 plus percent of these migrants are in the US. This is the interesting thing. Almost half of Salvadorans are undocumented. 60% of Guatemala, 68% of Honduras. In most cases, these are like invisible people, okay? You don't exist. You cannot access any public service because the moment you get identified and recorded, you can get reported and repatriated. So try to think for a second what it means to live like that, okay? Imagine you're here and you cannot show an ID to anyone, you cannot approach a bank, you cannot approach an hospital, okay? In some cases you can, but the fear of not knowing what might happen, it's, it, it's crazy. Lots of people transit through the region and, and these migrants generate approximately uh, Central America, so not only those three countries, they receive approximately $16 billion every year. It's a lot of money. This, um, the region is quite diverse, so some countries are becoming destination countries. There's multiple causality migration, so people don't necessarily leave because of poverty, they don't necessarily leave because of crime. It's often a combination of those. Uh, most of them have family uh, or, or relatives in the US. Mexico is now militarizing the border, so most of the apprehension uh, work that was happening at the southern border of the US is now being pushed down to the southern border of Mexico. There's increasing concerns of human rights violation and approximately 20% of the people being repatriated are minors. But there is a, a, an international law principle which is uh, very well consolidated, especially in the Latin America practices, which is the principle of the best interest of the child. So no matter what you're doing, you should be complying with the best interest of the child. So is it the best interest of the child to repatriate him, or should I uh, give him foster care? So that's consolidating as like a pillar of, of international uh, law. These are the stocks in the US. So as you can see, Mexicans are decreasing overall. So less people are leaving Mexico to go to the US, while the other, the other nationalities are growing. This is very interesting because like, Trump keeps claiming that there's an invasion of Mexican, but as you can see, since 2007, this is not true. Now the issue of uh, migrant children coming to the US, so thousands of people actually try to reach the US every single day, okay? So we're now focusing a little bit on a, on a subgroup of, of what's happening. So why do they leave? Well, first of all, the, the structural weaknesses of the, of the countries of origin, like 
poor school coverage, poverty, violence. Um, there's a few policies in the United States, like um, some acts, I, I will not go into details, but Obama has approved a couple of initiatives, so if you're an American citizen born there, or if, if you have like relatives there, kind of the, the regime is less strict in terms of repatriations, but they don't apply to most of these undocumented migrants. Nevertheless, the smugglers sell them as kind of, uh, how do you say? Um, uh, Points of leniency or something? Kind of, yeah, as like a moratoria or something or as, or as mass regularization. So you, you need to understand the smugglers do this thing for business, right? So they, they make money out of migrants. So they say it's, it's the right moment to go. If you, if you are getting there, you get a permit. They don't get any permit. They receive a court order to appear in front of a judge to get their case assessed before the deportation. But that piece of document written in English that they don't understand is, is, is sold as a permit. So they say, oh, you, you get a permit. More sophisticated smuggling networks, so the borders, we're talking about thousands and thousands of kilometers. So these organizations know very well where the patrols are, and, and they keep moving. So it's, it's, it's a very complicated situation. It was defined as a humanitarian crisis, but if you look at the figures, uh, if you look at the figures, these are the people apprehended at the southern border by fiscal year. So the, the fiscal year goes in until August, right? April. Uh, yeah. In the US? It should be April. Well, it's, it, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't match our calendar here. So, but if you look at the numbers, you can see that they were increasing since, they were increasing since 2012. So it's not, it's not something new of 2014. That's when it, be it became a huge thing in the news in 2014, but it's something that dates back from 2012. So the trend was already growing. And now the US government is celebrating because in fiscal year, the numbers dropped, you see? So the border is now safe. ISIS is not gonna come through the borders. The Mexicans are not coming through anymore. So these are a lot of the political, things you, you hear in the news. Let's try to understand that. Well, these are, the, these, are come, these are some of the totals. So you see the number of nationals making it to the southern border, right? This is in Spanish, but basically uh, NGOs and, and UNICEF, for instance, um, civil society in general say that for each minor you apprehend, there are three more that manage to go through. Okay, so try to uh, understand the magnitude of these exodus. So do you believe that less people are migrating? The situation has simply moved to the Mexican southern border. So Mexico is now apprehending many more people. So this is what happened. Um, so this is what happened. So the blue is 2014, red is 2014, and this one is 2015. So this is the figures of foreigners apprehended, presented in front of them, in, apprehended and, and presented in front of the immigration authorities at the south border of Mexico. As you can see, 2015 is way above the other two years. Are people migrating more? We don't know. Maybe Mexico is just more strict now. So maybe they're like raiding more and stopping more people. But it, 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 remains, a, it, remains, like a, it remains like a big thing. This is the breakdown of foreigners, but this is the most, this is, in my opinion, the most striking graph. So the f basically the first eight, nine months of 2015 are equivalent to the entire 12 months of 2014 in terms of apprehension of minors. So 4,000, approximately 3,500 children, people below age 18, uh, apprehended in Mexico. Imagine. Try to imagine all these kids, right? Uh, you need to feed them, you need to shelter them. So the vast majority are somehow teenagers between age 12 and 17, but you have also quite a lot of, quite a lot of kids who are very, very young. And uh, approximately, if you look at that other chart, approximately 50% of them are unaccompanied. Doesn't mean that they're traveling alone, they're usually traveling with a smuggler. 
and the other half are accompanying, the so-called family units, so with a relative or, or a father or a brother. These are some of the migration stations. So what happens to the repatriation? So this is data we get from, uh, I don't have Honduras because I couldn't compare the data they report in a different way, but these are data from El Salvador and Guatemala. So uh, Mexico repatriates by bus, put people on a bus, they transit through Guatemala and then they go to El Salvador or Honduras. Sometimes they fly you in, it depends. If they, if they catch you very north in Mexico, they fly you down. The US usually, uh, they have charter flights, so they send them back. Now, the repatriation by ground of Guatemalans, these are minors. Uh, no, these are total. They're up 120% compared to the previous year. Of these total of repatriations, 16% are children. If you look at the United States, repatriations to Guatemala are down 45%. Of those repatriated, only 0.5 are children. Why? Because the United States is a very uh, complex process, so you need to see a judge before you can get repatriated as a minor. It's the non refoulement uh, principle. But then, in the meantime, while you're waiting to see a judge, you cannot be detained, because that's illegal to detain a minor. So they get sent with relatives or with a family. The problem is that your relative or your family may be in Houston, in Maryland, or in Virginia, so they tend to lose track of that child. And then one year later or two years later, you have to go see the judge, because they're like backlogged. They're, you know, they're struggling to, to deal with all these cases. You don't know where the child is. So the percentage of those you can actually repatriate is almost zero. Some people call it order to appear in court, they call it order to disappear, because the mechanism is not really working. In the case of the Salvadorian, up 40%, 17% are minor, and in the case of uh, repatriation from the US, they're, they're down 25%. These are, well, these are some of statistics uh, of the region. So. Guatemala is monitoring the transit repatriation. In 2015, 125,000 migrants so far, including adults and minors. I don't know if you managed to figure out how big this figure is. I mean, you're a poor country, you're a poor small country in Central America like Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, and you will see thousands of people every month. I mean, imagine this bus is coming and, and how, how, do you, how, do you deal, how are you gonna deal with them? And this is, this is what's happening with the, um, here you see the, the total of minors. So, so far, approximately 10,000 kids have been repatriated to, to, this, to these three countries. Do you guys know what remittances are? Are you familiar more or less with the concept of remittances? So remittances is basically the, the resources sent back by migrants every month. I don't think there is a, an accepted definition of remittances, but you have a cleaning lady from uh, the Philippines, okay? And every month she goes to Western Union, she's gonna drop 300 euros transfer them to the Philippines, and then someone is gonna go to, is go, is gonna go to the Western Union there and is gonna cash those money, right? That's an example of remittances. That's an example of a cash to cash remittances. So in terms of, uh, this is in absolute, absolute number, so remittances to Latin America and the Caribbean have reached uh, a new record of $65 billion. This is, these are estimates, right? Because there's a lot of remittances that we don't measure. So uh, in Italy, it's very common to have uh, workers from Moldova or Romania, and they have a very capillar networks of buses and shuttles going to Moldova and Romania. So a lot of times, it's much cheaper than flying, it's much cheaper than uh, regular buses, so they, they stack up a little bit of cash into a, a box with clothes and, and food, and then they send them back. So you, it's really hard to record those remittances, and then you have also in-kind remittances, which is like goods and, and clothing, you cannot get there. We're talking about money here. But in terms of uh, Central America, we're above 
15%. So usually this, this thing you see here is kind of the 2009, 2008 recession. Now remittances are, are going up again. This is interesting because it explains the correlation between the US labor market and, and remittances. So this empleo means unemployment. So unemployment is going down, employment is going up, and, and remittances are also remittances are also catching up. So the trend is the trend is is consistent with how the labor market is going. And this is the market in Spain. So this is the construction sector. When you have an economic recession, the first thing you stop doing is building a house because it's, it's very expensive. Services are usually hit a little bit less, and and like low skilled migrants tend to be a lot of time tends to be carpenters, tends to be builders, tend to be welders, like heavy duty, uh, not very fancy office jobs. So. The labor market is, is catching up again, so we are also seeing more remittances from Spain to Latin America. So can I ask yeah. a quick question on the previous slide? Yeah. So, so remittances track the U.S. labor market, but my impression is that the, the, the people arriving mm -hmm. track the labor market when it went, I mean, when unemployment increased, but it has quite tracked the, the decrease in unemployment or the increase in employment lately, or is that is that the wrong picture? Can you, can you repeat your so, question? So Ian? remittances track the labor market quite well. Mm -hmm. My impression is that the, the, the people arriving mm -hmm. uh, hasn't quite tracked the labor market, that it did for a period of time, that the worsening of the labor market was followed by a decline in people coming, but that the improvement in the labor market lately hasn't quite been followed by an increase in similar magnitudes, is that a reasonable picture, or is that? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I, I get your question. So, of course, migration flows respond to how the labor market is going. Right. Okay. That's, for instance, between Central America and the U.S. That's obvious. So it doesn't matter how many how many walls you build or how many patrols you you put. If people know that you can find a job as a cleaning person or selling sandwiches, you're gonna try to to get there because there is job. So the, 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 the main kind of pull factor, if you want, is, is the labor market. Okay? Right. So that's so my, my question was that it seems like the tracking has become less, uh, there's a, the, the correlation is not as strong as it used to be. That was my question. I don't know. Okay. I'm, not a, I'm not a labor market uh, economist. But you, what usually you tend to see is that when you have an economic okay. recession, yeah. Migrants are the ones most vulnerable because they tend to be undocumented. They tend to be. They tend to have like a lower pay, so automatically they remit less. That's kind of what this graph is. That's what what this graph is trying to say. Then we can look into more detail and see which one comes first. Uh, but I think I, I don't have the evidence here. Now this is the percentage of over GDP. So as you can see, for some countries, it's a lot of money. Uh, we're talking about 20% for Haiti, we're talking about 20%, almost 20% for 18% for El Salvador, so it's a lot of resources. Haiti is, Haiti is probably going down because people were remitting uh, more in the past year to support the reconstruction after the earthquake. Remember there was a big earthquake in Haiti? Haiti is a huge diaspora in Florida, so even, even in the middle of an economic recession, some years back, remittances to Haiti were very, very high compared to the region because people respond to, respond to that. You see this? The earthquake was in 2010, right? 2011. So this yellow one, you can see that is, is, is up compared to the other countries. It's very interesting. So there's a lot of studies on the importance of the diaspora on resilience, right? So you have a, a, flood, a flood or you have like a massive natural disaster the diaspora starts sending money to their families to, to have them back. Excuse me? Yeah. Are there any reliable figures on Cuba, by any chance, or does it not exist? Oh, that's a great question. I have no idea. That would be so interesting to see. I don't know. Uh, Cuba does officially have the written figures from their national bank. And are these reliable? <laughs> that's anybody's guess. Yeah, because I think you can't really, you can't use cards, you can't transfer money to Cuba from the US. Now you can. 
No, you can. Yeah, but the legislation changed in I think August or so, so it's quite quite recent. Yeah, I have no idea. And you have five minutes. Yeah. Now we go very quickly. Okay. Now, for uh, for instance, another question that I have, I have no explanation is why Panama is skyrocketing. Mm. Some 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 colleagues say that it's because of the because um, many Venezuelan are in Panama, so they probably and and there is like a big crisis in Venezuela now. So they tend to kind of transfer resources to Panama. I don't know. Suriname. I don't know why they're skyrocketing. But these are, sometimes it might be due to the way they measure them or, or the way they get reported. But anyway. Well, and Central America is growing. But now this is interesting. This is, uh, I'll, I'll go super quick. This graph estimates the economic value the, the wealth of the diaspora. Okay? So the diaspora sends a certain amount of money in terms of remittances, but there is a, a massive wealth into diaspora in terms of like savings, uh, assets that they have, which tend to be many more times the remittances they're sending. And, and the professor from UCLA who developed this graph is arguing that the region actually doesn't need development aid. The, the region needs to bankerize uh, some of these resources that are being sent to the regions. Because a lot of remittances are like cash to cash, but if you manage to channel some of that wealth into the banking sector, uh, the region would be much better off. Now, I don't know if you guys are looking into um, some research stuff for your project eventually, because probably in January or February you need to come up with your research question. So my piece of advice, uh, looking into the, you know, looking into what to do after and like finding a job, where do I start? Uh, should I start from UNHCR on or IOM or all these organizations? Is try to focus on something real and relevant and applied. Okay, because the master's program is really about being able to apply what you studied in class. So now you're working on analyzing a data set or doing a literature review. Uh, make sure that when you finish your, your master, you can actually join a team of any organization and be able to do it in practice. So my, my strong advice would be pick a project, Google stuff. Are you interested in migrant children? Are you interested in migrant women? Uh, Google a UN agency that is doing this, or a development organization that is doing that, pick up the phone, call them, and say, can I look into your project and assess what you're doing? It's, it's a free assessment for them, and it's a business card for you guys who apply your skills into something real. And when you then apply for jobs, you can email the executive summary of, of a real project you have done. So I would encourage you to be extremely applied because when, when people interview you, they say, have you ever done something like that? Can you show me like a written sample or can you give an example of policy recommendation? So this is just Central America. I mean, the nexus on crime, on what happens to the children who don't migrate or what happens to the children who uh, get repatriated, the social implication, there's so many things and, and Michaela and the migration guys here, they can give you a long list. But in general, no matter what your specialization is, call people, rely on the network of the School of Governance and, 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 and apply stuff. It's much more interesting for you than just wondering about like a data set or things like that. And we also have, we also have access to data sets uh, if you need them. Yeah, these are some <coughs> pictures of the detention center in Mexico. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's technically called the migrant station, right? But, it's, but when NGOs call it detention center, yeah, it's a little bit too militarized for being a migrant station. Uh, so this, this, this is the river between Mexico and Guatemala. So people, like, people trade and carry just about anything, and now you see soldiers. 
that's when they get repatriated. So a lot of time they cover their face in shame because it's a failure, right? You were you failed in achieving your American dream and you got apprehended and now you're back. And now you're back with seven thousand dollars in debt because you have to pay the coyotes and now you need to pay that debt. So it's it's a huge issue now. Anyway, thank you very much. Um I hope I increase by at least 1% your interest in, in migration. <laughs> uh, it, it's a super interesting, uh, you know, besides working on it, I think it's a super interesting topic because you see it in the news, it's very, very relevant. It's highly politicized. There's so few people who actually read the statistics and try to understand it. Uh, if you look at the European debate, it's, it's ridiculous. Let's build walls, let's send them back, and they're stealing our... None of the, probably none of the policymakers actually sit down for five minutes and look at some numbers or... So I think it's an area where, it, where more practitioners are really, really needed in Europe, but there's a lot going on outside Europe. I mean, I, I know zero about Africa, but I'm sure that there's a lot of stuff happening there. So, I don't know, if you have any questions, uh, I'm here for you guys. Thank you very much. So please, we now have about 12 minutes for questions. So I'm happy to hear them from the audience. I'm sure Nicola is too. Yeah. And do you, know, do you know how many people from your course are working now um, in this um, field? And um, is it hard to find a job? I mean, it's now in the news, but how? Um, how hard is it to find a job in this So I'm not, so I know that quite a few people from the migration cohort are either at the IOM, which is the International Organization for Migration, uh, or migration related uh, agencies. So when I started working, I, I was not focusing on migration. I was focusing on the, I would say the develop kind of the first semester <laughs> of the master. So I was dealing with social inclusion development projects uh, at the IDB. I was, I was dealing with something else. Um, you know, how to assess an issue, how to draft a, a project, uh, how to propose a budget, how to discuss with a counterpart. Those things is not really something you learn. Um, you have you know, you have the academic background on like, if I do a survey, I need to make sure it captures this, captures that. Um, migra migration remains quite of a niche area, right? So many people work on it, UNICEF, UNHCR, but very few people actually understand it. Uh, because it's always analyzed from the security perspective or from the humanitarian perspective. Uh, and, and sometimes they just don't get it. After a while, um, well, I was able to to work in a team that is related to that, but I'm, I, I'm quite sure that probably in the coming months we will see more uh, more agencies or, or more government body needing people into into that area. So And maybe I can also add because we were in the same cohort. I think about four out of ten of us are still in the migration field, but of the f cohorts that came after, many more are, and part of it is the growth of the field. I think you're right, because those agencies like even UNDP, UNICEF, are really starting to invest in migration projects and in migration policy. And I think Nicola said it very well, is that there's a real lack of specialists. Even at an organization like IOM, I would say about 20% of their staff know anything about migration, and the other 80% are logistics or their, their financing, or whatsoever. So I think organizations will really be looking out for specialists with regional expertise and with subpopulation expertise. So for instance, yeah. on children, on women, on refugees, on law, on whatsoever. So if you want to stay in the migration field, I would recommend to specialize in a very particular aspect of it. Even even finance, even the, fin yeah. the, the banking sector, because now they realize that migration is not like a, an issue that you can turn on and off, right? They realize it, it, it's part of the development of a country. I mean, Italy sent out migrants until the 60s for like for 60 years. And uh, so, so it's like it's like generational trends uh, that 
that impact the country. So even development agencies are now realizing that this is not this is not just a humanitarian issue. So when the war is over, it will stop. It, it, it's part of, of, of long trend. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that the, the um, Inter-American Development Bank offers uh, some consulting services to uh, different states and um, channels. Uh, could you elaborate on the kind of things that, that those services that they offer, and do any of them relate to migration? Um, yeah, the second one is the... I'll start from the second one. The IDB does not have a migration team. Okay, so sometimes I feel like I'm talking with the wall when I'm talking with my, is this, are you recording this? <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, sometimes it's, it's, it hasn't traditionally focused on that, so it's kind of a new topic. We have, we have a division that deals with security, so they deal with borders, police, the justice system, but now I think the, the institution is realizing that it's, it's a big issue for the region, so uh, I think we're slowly building a team. Going back to the first question, um, People, governments don't come to the bank just for the money. I think the, the bank calls, and, and the bank does, doesn't just lend you the money like this. They're usually a joint work into designing a project. I, I'll give an example. The country of Jamaica wants to organize a, an initiative on youth entrepreneurship, and they want to set up a startup centers so that young people with an idea can get mentorship and access funding and get supported into the market. This translates into drafting a document together, so literally saying, this is the situation, the scope of the work is this, we're gonna fund this, we're gonna fund that. But this is done jointly. And a lot of time, the weaker the country, the more you have to put into deciding what to do. Of course, it's a sovereign country, so of course you have to discuss it with that, but a lot of time you have to do research or, or gather data that they don't have. And the bank funds a lot of consultancies. Um, the School of Governance is now doing a study for the competitiveness division of the Inter-American Development Bank on highly skilled migrants, how they flow around Latin America and how they impact the competitiveness. So what should countries do to retain talent or, you know, these type of things. But um, consultancies tend to be a nice, uh, tends to be the most common way to enter the World Bank. So they rely on a lot of consultants because the region is big, there's multiple issues, so there's a lot of external consultants developing research uh, for, for the institution. So that's something, so your, a presentation of your thesis might actually turn into a request of, of, of doing a consult, uh, consultancy for them. Um, do you know if there's been much work done in relation to the migration of women within this region? Because uh, certainly in Central America, there tends to be from the poor areas a move up, for, for example, in Nicaragua to Costa Rica, a lot of women are going out to find work because they tend to find that they're more employable than men to get jobs, such as working in houses and things. Um, and sort of the impact that has on family life and development of children, it's, it's, uh, many studies done that. That's, that's a brand new field. Uh, I was, three days ago, they launched, UNHCR launched a report called Women on the Run. One year ago, they launched a report called Children on the Run, which focused on this children crisis. Very interesting, but it's, it's based on a small sample. It was built on 100 kids or something like that. So they conclude that they live for violence. If you, not, if you analyze another sample, they conclude they live for family unification. So which one is it? I mean, it, it's clearly multiple causes, but um, it, it's, it's a complex field. So there isn't, there isn't uh, much going on. I didn't get a chance to read the women on the, on the run, but I guess it's, it has a similar structure of the one on children on the run. But that's a, that's a great topic. Like gender studies, not only in terms of women, but in terms of gender, right? So the impact on adolescent boys who, who struggle to stay out of gangs, because gangs recruit m mainly boys. But then the impact on, on women who are supposed to entertain the, the boys of the gangs or who are pregnant when they're uh, teenagers. So, Gender, in terms of like gender-specific issues, it's it's something completely new. So if 
if, if, that's, if you're interested in that, uh, this region of the world really needs a lot of, a lot of research on that. And I'm sorry, if I can also add on that, um, we've also done a few studies here on the effects of migration on children who remain behind. And when we were doing part of the background for this, we did realize that there is some going on in Latin America, some studies of this, uh, but particularly in South America, in uh, Bolivia, there have been quite a few studies of the effects of mothers migrating and what effect that has on, on ch uh, children and family life. But to be quite honest, it's very ad hoc. And I think that a lot of the research that's coming out of the region now is very poorly coordinated. I think it's exactly those convenient samples. So I would totally support as well you looking into that topic in Central America, because I think that it is a bigger trend. The feminization of migration we know is picking up in this region. And it will have some implications for the way families are organized and function. So I say go for it. Yeah, and if you you know, and if you like uh, traveling a little bit and the adventure, I would I would strongly encourage you to kind of you know save a little bit of money and then devote two weeks of your research months for your thesis to just go there. So like, book as many meetings as you can, chase NGOs, chase key informants, uh, call the local UNDP, UNICEF, whatever office. Go there for a week or two and interview as many people as you can, take pictures, uh, qualitative uh, uh, data, and, and do your research in that way. Because you see, you see it firsthand, you build a network, so you get to know these people, you share your thesis with these informants after your research is done, uh, and you really get to understand the, the local context. So that's, that's uh, something you could do. You don't need to go all that far. I mean, you can study something in Europe without uh, buying a more expensive ticket. But I think that the hands-on work is, is very important. We do have time for one last question, if anybody's interested. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, it's more about content. Um, in Europe, we have a big discussion about why most of the refugees are actually coming only to Austria, Germany, and you know, mainly to, to these three countries. And so far, the most common argument that you always hear is that they only come to make use of the welfare system there in these countries. Um, so basically, they come for economic purposes. But recently, I heard also another, in my opinion, more um, a better uh, theory that they actually come because in these countries you have diaspora communities. So my question is, in the context of America, um, if you have with the focus on migrant children, if these children are actually going mostly to the U.S. for economic reasons or in the richer countries generally, or do they more go to to, to countries where actually the other diaspora communities are? So, the, the prevailing reason is family reunification. Okay, so maybe it's not the trigger point of migration, so you have had a relative somewhere in the U.S. who left 20 years ago, you know that your uncle, your aunt, your brother, your cousin is somewhere there. That's not the trigger of migration. Maybe the trigger of migration is increased violence in your neighborhood, or like the school is really crap, or the situation is unbearable. So that's the trigger. But one reason that really facilitates migration is your network. So you have contacts there. So that's really the case of, of Latin America. Now, regarding the question of are people using the welfare services, this was a question that was raised uh, three days ago when they launched the um, Migration Development Report, the Global Migration, what is it called? The Global Migration Report mm -hmm. of the IOM. It, it's like the Human Development Report of the UNDP, but this is only on migration. It's, it's, it's very easy to read. I encourage you to have a look. And the focus is on the role of cities, how cities are managing these people, how mayors, what mayors are doing. It's, it's very applied. And the question was like, yeah, so let's assume they are undocumented, so let's, not, let's save money and let's deny them these welfare services. Okay, you're not undocumented, you can access these welfare services only if you can pay. The, there are some estimates of having like sick people, uneducated people, would represent a cost, a welfare cost, which would be like much way higher than providing those services. So as a, as a host country, countries have an interest in making sure that the people who come in are wealthy, are healthy, well-educated, and they will be wealthy eventually. Because you want to have someone who 
can graduate, who can start a business, rather than someone who is like starving and poor who ends up robbing in your houses. So that, that's one argument. Why are they going to Austria and Germany or the Scandinavian countries? Because the labor market there is stronger than the south of Europe or Greece. So Greece is a transit country. Greece default, kind of defaulted uh, yesterday, right? So the labor market there is not ready to absorb all these people. So it's, it's, it's a transit, it's basically a transit country. Uh, but like, if you look even at the, at the German labor market, I mean, the fertility rate is down. Uh, so, you know, so many European countries need workers. Uh, we, we should do like a very strategic assessment and say, we need this many mechanics, this many people who can install windows, this many people who are carpenters and issue visas based on that, because that would be much, much cheaper. That would be much, so controlling migration based on our egoistic uh, economic needs would be much more efficient and much cheaper than sending 1,000 rescue people to the border and organizing buses and, uh, but, but then there is the political element in it, right? So how do you sell it? Ah, that's a great question. I, I don't have an answer. I don't think maybe Michaela has, uh, she knows the Europe much better than I do. So. Uh, I, I think that it's true that there is a really strong role for the diaspora, but it's also word of mouth. And I think that's something that is, it makes you, Me Mexico, US is a very different historical context than is, let's say, recent refugee flows in Austria. And what we see with Austria, Germany, Sweden, uh, Norway, is that there's a strong word of mouth element. People are receiving information about the hospitality that is, let's say, six to nine months old. They're making their migration trajectory decisions based on information that was applicable in the late 90s, maybe, or even in the early 2000s, or even as recently as nine months ago, and that doesn't necessarily match the reality. And then you have, of course, very uh, public policies, like uh, you know, Angela Merkel saying, yes, we're going to host everybody. And that sends a strong signal that you can redirect flows. So I think it's not only about the diaspora presence, that's definitely part of it, and that facilitates the reintegration, or the integration, rather, in those societies, but I don't think that's what necessarily determines the trajectory. But I'm sorry to, to curtail the discussion. Thank you very much for participating in this seminar. Nicola, thank you very much for being here. Okay.